you know, ghosts have always been a, a thing with me since I was a little kid, you know? Very scared little kid. Going to people's houses, I'd visit them, and then I'd be like, it's time to leave now. I never slept over anybody's house because I was very scared of things. And just, you know, it was on my mind, and I thought it was a very universal subject also. I go to India, Japan, or wherever, and everybody has ghost stories, you know? Don't go in that house. It's, it's haunted. And uh, I, I wanted to tell a story about that. The first draft of Sixth Sense turned out to be everything that I was fearing. Just the, the most, you know, derivative, you know, thing you'd ever read with cliched lines and cheesy one-liners and familiar arcs and everything was, you know, the fear just came right out of me going, you can't write those, see, this is garbage, you know? And I threw that out, threw that one out, didn't look at it again, wrote another draft from page one, did that one, that was garbage. And I was like, you know, there's gotta be something in here, you know, a line or something that, that works. Didn't, there was nothing, <laughs> there was nothing that I kept, threw that one out, started again. Somewhere in the third or fourth draft, the idea came to me of a, a hyper-compassionate child that this is happening to, you know, and that's why he was chosen, to, to have this gift to see ghosts. Ironically, the first great lines that I wrote for that character aren't in the movie and weren't in the final draft, but they started me realizing who Cole was as a character. Action, Haley. There came, oh wow, now I got one scene that's, that's original in this redundant, derivative movie. And I was like, no matter what, if I work as hard as I can, this is just gonna be a good movie. What can I do to, to put it over the top? And then I just sat there and got the idea for the ending. That changed everything. Basically, it was a feeling like you can't lose, you know, because you got Michael Jordan waiting there if you need him to, to sink the last basket. Can't lose, and so you suddenly, everything I wrote was stronger than it had ever been, and I was writing, you know, as if I was Cole and as if I was Malcolm Crow, and all these things were starting to build because I was just so excited about the idea. I felt like I had an ace in the hole, you know, this, this ending and it just strengthened everything. Suddenly I was writing characters like I'd never written them and storylines were emerging and suspense was emerging and before I turned around and looked at it, I realized that you know, I had made a personal film of a fictional story and it was the first time I did it and when I realized I did it, I was like, okay, now let's go and sell this thing. That was already much better. I did that on the last tape. No, you didn't. Yes, that, you did. did a real casual. Let's go to Chris the Murphy. videotape. No, no. I read it in one night. I read it you know, very quickly. And, uh, agreed to do it very quickly. I was as surprised by the ending in the script, I think, as the audience was in the theater. I was completely uh, unprepared for that ending. Look away, look away this way. Once I knew the ending of the film and that my character was indeed dead, uh, I had to forget about it and act as if I weren't. Never really thought about acting as a ghost. If you could change something in your life, anything at all, what would it be? Mm -hmm. You don't have to answer me now. Each movie has its own theme, and Sixth Sense's theme was communication, you know, and, and that, that's just for me, you know, to kind of tie all the characters together so that it feels a part of one journey, you know, that the mother's trying to talk to the son, you know, the, the husband, Malcolm, is trying to talk to his wife, and all these ghosts are trying to talk to Cole, you know? And that this, everyone learning to communicate is kind of the point of the movie. Can I give you the right expression? <laughs> the second audition was the first time we had a real long conversation about him there, and I guess uh, the nerves went away because I just got into talking about the character with them and talking about how much, uh, uh, you know, how Cole really feels for the people he sees and, and how the film was about communication. It wasn't just about ghosts. Put the camera on, Kyle. One last rehearsal. This is your... Okay, rehearsal's up. Last time for everyone to make mistakes. He's a rare individual in Hollywood because most films come from modern fiction, modern novels, remakes of old films, remakes of uh, TV shows from the 60s. And Knight just makes these stories up out of his head. He's a great storyteller. He, he thinks in big pictures. I mean, although he does think about individual shots, he thinks about telling the story with the camera. Like here, Olivia? Um, how about... How's that, Carl? Yeah. Come on, come on. 
at a very early point in the film, it, it became very much less about a child psychologist as it was about a man searching for some answer. Uh, even though the answer was in the room with him, it was like he was stumbling about in the dark trying to find the door. You're pretty quiet in school, but you're very intelligent. You've never really been in any bad trouble. I wrote Malcolm with very little dialogue for obvious reasons, you know. His eyes become our narration. And so when the kid says something about drawings and then he draws people and he drew a kid, a guy with a screwdriver in his neck, his reaction and all of that stuff is so important, you know, to, to see the arc of non-believer to believer in his eyes. How do you draw now? I draw people smiling, dogs running. Rainbows. I never really thought of my character as being irredeemable or in need of redemption. Are you a good doctor? I used to be. He's quoted as being a brilliant uh, psychoanalyst, psychotherapist, child psychologist. In the field of child psychology. I actually thought of him as being less than brilliant. It was more that he, you know, kind of living a lie. You concentrate. He was just as scared as everybody else. I just had a stack of scripts that I had to read on a flight, and um, that was the first one I grabbed. Vincent Gray is a very troubled kid, and he does something very violent, and he looks very scary. But deep down, Donnie's, you know, a very, very sweet, caring person, and he was, and so I said, wow, that would be very interesting to see that person at the lowest point. You know, um, it would hurt us to see that, and it would hurt Malcolm to see that prior to the shooting, it would hurt him, you know? And um, Donnie, basically, he was at a place in his life where he was ready to commit, you know, a thousand percent to this five minute scene that he had in this movie. I don't know how many people would have committed the way he did. This is for five minutes of screen time. This dude was like, you know, really messed up. The whole vibe of the set changed. You know, we were making movies until he walked onto the set. A character like Vincent, I mean, how could you really relate to him? He's just been tortured his whole life. You know, he's been hiding his whole life. He's been in pain his whole life and, and not had anyone to help him. He was told that he had mood disorders or that, you know, there was some emotional problem, and there wasn't. I mean, there was a much greater problem. He had the same problem that, um, that Cole had. You know, he saw dead people. I didn't quite know how to prepare for that, other than to sort of tap into um, feelings and fears that I had um, as a child and that still linger inside. Vincent, why are you crying? You won't believe. But the one thing I did know is I had to somehow suffer. I had to come away from the comforts that I was used to having. Wow, you look a lot different than you did in the movie. Yeah, I'm what? eating. I'm eating again. <laughs> a lot of people make a big deal about the weight loss, um, you know, because I physically sort of transformed, and that that almost came by mistake. After uh, you know the first two weeks of sort of dieting and stuff, I I had lost about you know 15 pounds, and um, I realized I still had three weeks to go before shooting, so I kept going. Then it became sort of you know, unhealthy because then it became 20 pounds and then it became 25 pounds. But I started to sort of go through a lot of emotional changes and I started to really be alone. And I started to really suffer in more ways than I could have ever planned. Do you know why you're afraid when you're alone? I remember one night I went down now to Philadelphia um, and it was just a few days away from shooting and um, a friend of mine came to visit we went out into the park and he said, look, he said, you want to, you know, go over your stuff or anything? And I said, yeah, we can go through it. And he said, well, why don't you be Vincent and I'll be like Vincent's friend. And we started, you know, to sort of just improvise walking through the park. And it was real late at night. And um, he started talking to me and I instantly knew that Vincent doesn't have any friends. And I didn't, you know, Vincent probably wouldn't be able to tell if this guy was a ghost or a real person. So I just took off and I hid in some bushes in the park and I ended up staying there you know, well into like the early morning. And then I just decided to walk around a little while, you know, I just decided to stay out and, um, and just try to exist, you know, and, 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 
in the state that I was in. And um, it was hard. It was really hard. And I couldn't go into the hotel and just order room service. And I just couldn't do that. Um, I, I just I couldn't allow myself to do that because it just would have been robbing, you know, myself of, of something I needed to experience to, to, to do this part properly. I mentioned it to Bruce that I wanted to be naked in the scene. He said, that sounds cool, but why do you want to do that? My take was that Vincent was ready to end his suffering and he wasn't hiding anymore. He tried drugs, he tried rebelling, and he tried, you know, probably wearing dark makeup and, and every outlet he could have to, to get away from the pain and the fear that he was feeling. And, and he was ready to end it. And so why bury him in clothes and, and give off some impression that he's a, a rebellious kid or whatever? Because he wasn't, he was a, a tortured kid. That's really good. Knight came over and Bruce said, L Donnie, you know, tell me your idea, tell me your idea. And I told him and Knight thought it was a great idea. Okay, hit it. On, on action, Donnie, you say, did you get him? Did you get him drunk? The underwear was sort of the compromise. You know, when it was time to shoot the scene, they recommended I put on some pants, and I, I just didn't want to. So we settled on tidy whiteies, And, uh, you know, they stained them up real good and, and made them look really weathered. Action. You know why you're afraid when you're alone? When they said rolling, I just was a nervous wreck. I was shaking like a leaf. I wanted to do good. I wanted to not ruin the film, you know, but I wanted to to do what I set out to do, you know, which is is be true to this character and, and to let everyone in that room feel a bit of what I was feeling, which was only a bit of what he was feeling. Don't look at me! I don't want to be afraid no more. I don't have 10 years for you! I'm not giving you nothing! Bruce's character didn't remember my character. And he's saying, wait a minute, give me a chance to, to remember. And it's like, no, I waited 10 years for you. I'm not waiting anymore. I improvised that line. All the preparation and all the understanding of the character and all, you know, all this, everything involved just led to, to being able to have that line just come out naturally. Because I knew Vincent had waited 10 years to tell this guy that he didn't, he didn't deliver. You failed me! I don't remember the first take at all. I don't remember doing it. I remember when it ended, I went through everything. I was supposed to just stop at the last line of dialogue, and I guess I went back and got the gun and turned around and shot it. There were no blanks in it, but I shot it, and then I shot it at Bruce and then shot it at myself. You just give me a chance. Cut. Knight just came running into the bathroom. It was incredible, but he asked, can you do another take? Can you do something? Danny told me, he said, if you can't do it, we got enough. I mean, that, I guess, was the big surprise because, you know, I mean, I figured it's, it might even take two days, you know, to do it, and that'll be another day of starvation. Had I listened to my instincts, I probably wouldn't have played the part um, <laughs> because my instincts told me that it was gonna be really difficult to do. The emotional stuff that you see Cole go through, you have to imagine that Vincent went through it every day of his life until this moment in the film where he's decided that he won't go through it anymore. So to play someone who's suffered that greatly, I knew that I would have to go to places that, you know, I may not have been ready to go to. But for this script and for this director, I, I, I was willing to go there. I'd like to try to control circumstances that would cause people to be hurt. As an example, my three children. I, I try to control things and keep them out of harm's way. Uh, and when that, when that fails occasionally, I, it, it's, it's a difficult thing for me. And I, I just used that. I just thought, of, you know, thought about that, about how I had failed uh, Donnie Wahlberg's character. And, you know, realized it and then made that big giant leap that this, you know, may also be happening to Cole. Anybody who has to deal with that has got to be brave. He always has to be brave because he can't avoid it. He didn't fall apart completely like Vincent. I mean, he and Vincent are a lot alike, but I guess Cole maybe might be a little stronger. And he, and though he uh, 
he feels for the people that he, he sees. I think that's the one thing that, that keeps him from completely falling apart. What's amazing about Haley is, I talked to him as an actor, not as a child actor, and that was irrelevant that he was, that he was young, you know, just directly as another actor, in the best way, an inspired actor, which is, uh, you know, the, the greatest thing you hope for. And um, the one thing we did with Cole, which I learned a lot of lessons from my, my previous movie, which was Wide Awake, which also starred another 10-year-old, was um, showing a child sad is basically to empty all the reserves that the, the audience has. If they have any, whatever that amount is that they have of, you know, we'll go with you and we're going to give as much as we can emotionally before you, we get back, it empties it entirely. When you see a child, you know, sad on screen, it's like, okay, it's all gone, and now what? You better have something good now because um, I got nothing left and I got no patience left. And um, that's something I learned, you know, the hard way. And, I, and so Haley um, and I sat down at the beginning of the movie and I said, you can't ever be sad in this movie, okay? And so you can express it, you can express emotions as fear, you can express anger. I want you to be a fighter. I don't want you to mope at all. I want you to fight this with every fiber of your being, your existence, you know? The things that are happening, you fight it. So a place where he could go wrong is when he goes out of the tent, he goes to the bathroom, and I thought it was his mom in the kitchen, and she turns around with the slit wrists. Mama? No. Dinner is not ready. You can't hurt me anymore! And then he starts running back to his safety of his tent. He gets in his tent, and he's so upset that he went out and got scared. Nine times out of ten, a filmmaker would say, just cry there. Just want you to cry, you're sad. Oh, and sadness, and we go to black. You know, what a sad existence for this child. That's not the way we played it. We played it, you come in and you're so angry at yourself for breaking your own rule that you never leave that tent. You know, and you're so stupid to have done that. And you know how to beat this thing. And this, you've made up the rules, and why did you leave? You know, never fall for that again and fight it. And meanwhile, tears are falling. But he's fighting it. You know, you never go out there. You never, I told you never go out there. You know what I mean? Talking to him, he's the only one who can help himself. He feels alone. And that, we fade on that kid. Haley Joel came in completely prepared to, you know, play this part. And when I was working with him, when I was working with him as an actor, as one actor to another, I found them very compelling to watch. Not too long after we started filming, I realized that that would be an interesting thing to just use, to just watch him and be fascinated by him, because I was. I was fascinated by this 11-year-old boy who has this incredible acting talent. And just how weird it is to see that in a, in a young man, in a young, in a young you know, boy, to see this guy acting and crying on cue, on take 16, cry at the same spot every time. OK, here we go. Marker. And action. He was two things on that film. He was a little boy, a little 11-year-old boy. And when they said action, he was an 11-year-old man-child who was capable of a really broad range of emotions and a real lightness, a real light touch in his performance that is really rare in, in all actors and re incredibly rare in child actors. Ready? Let's do it. Okay. When you guys walk go. in, a banana is He's very much a kid. When he's with other kids, he does play and he's normal, whatever that is. But he's very abnormal too because he's brilliant. And it kind of makes sense because kids are less self-conscious. But to have his, his understanding is crazy. He's one of a kind. They, they broke the mold after Haley. When you discuss the character, it wasn't a kid who sees dead people. It's a, it's a sensitive kid. This is a movie about communication. Oh, and he also sees dead people. <laughs> His sensitivity for other people and stuff like that, that, that comes, I guess, that's, that's why, that's sort of the theory why he gets uh, the gift. Not really a blessing, though. <laughs> you know, he has to go through things that he really shouldn't have to experience at such a young age. And that has an effect on him, you know, mentally, you know, because he hasn't even grown up yet and he's already experiencing these things, so he's lost a lot of that innocence. Okay, here we go. I'd never really read anything as whole as this story. It's just so complete and everything that happens is completely justified. Nothing is gratuitous. The characters are completely whole. Their journeys are quite unusual and yet very identifable. I really seem to understand what Lynn was about.
without having to kind of register a lot. It was more of a visceral kind of reaction and quite immediate. But it was just the the tone of the whole thing. It was like jumping in a really beautiful river and just swimming with it, you know? Tony is great. I mean she it was it wasn't hard at all to uh to pretend that she was that she was, you know, my mother in the film. And it's really hard for Cole to keep the secret from her. Uh, and even though he really loves her, and even though that's that's really the only person before Malcolm that he can trust. I actually find it shocking myself that I somehow understood this whole maternal thing because, well, certainly before we made that movie, I'd never really had any maternal instincts. I guess it doesn't even matter that it's a mother and, and son. I think it's just about, I would die for this person. I love this person so much. When something is so strong, you would do anything and you will go insane if 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 they're in pain and, and she's so unable to help him in his despair, which is so clear to her. And, and even people who are meant to be professionals can't identify what is going on with him. And that's a really scary state to be in. The test would indicate he did not have a seizure. Guilty notions swimming around inside of Lynn because she's trying to be two parents for this boy. She's not educated, but she's smart. She's streetwise and she knows, you know, how to get things together. And, and I, th I think that she's smart emotionally as well. You know, she's very in tune with her son. If you're not very mad, do I sleep in your bed tonight? I'm not very mad. Even though she hasn't got much, what she has, she's doing the best with it. And she's kind of a control freak in that way, you know? Um, so when he turns around and kind of throws her world in her face and it becomes complete confusion. Um, I think it takes somebody kind of trusting and brave to be able to go through that change into something else and to learn from somebody whom you think you've been teaching. That scene where they play that game, the step forward, step back game, I kept sucking the camera back on every um, mistake that Bruce made, you know, to accent Bruce's feeling that this kid's slipping away from him. Bruce kept just shifting in his seat, and it was a real gentle physical acting moment that was wonderful to see a big action hero, you know, sitting in a chair and just, you know, he's, he's trying to get again comfortable again to, okay, so um, let's do this again. The next question, you know, he's losing the kid. And, you know, just those subtle shifts, so unfamiliar to us to see Bruce Willis do that. And, and he did it so wonderfully. It made us so connected to him. Okay. Night. Yeah, what's up? I work on, on little things like that, on, on things of trying to say a great deal with as little, I guess, effort as possible, as little seeing the acting. You know, I don't want you to see the acting. I just want you to see the behavior. How just... You know, your own opinion. Why do I look at my pants hiked way up? Okay. Hey, camera marker. That's the right answer. <laughs> you know, the first thing I told Bruce was, I need to see you vulnerable in this movie, you know, because you have such an air, he has such an air about him of, no matter what happens, he'll, he'll figure it out. And I wanted to see him hurt and vulnerable. And it's something we, we worked on, and he's, I mean, just given such, just such, such poignant performance in the role. It's wonderful to see that side of him. When I look through the lens or I look through the monitor, sometimes I don't even recognize him. He did this one moment where we were on this dock on the water and he was giving his kind of wedding speech to his wife. And the way he broke down during the speech, giving the speech in front of this crowd, the place was like chilled. I never thought that I could stand up here in front of my friends and my family. And, um, and tell you what's inside of me. But I can today. I think he's done definitely some of his best work, if not his best work. He's, I'm, I'm so proud to have him in the movie. It's just, you, know, you get all that electricity of having him, because he's a superstar, and he walks in the room, you know, he's a superstar. You get all that, and you get the real human being inside him for like the first time ever, you get a glimpse of what he's like. It was nice to be able to play a gentle character I had done a couple of films that were ungentle or not about, you know, being uh, uh, an introspective character. And I've done probably more of those than I have 
films where I play introspective characters. So it was a nice change of pace. He was wonderful, and I feel very lucky that I got an actor who was as good as he was to uh, have play Malcolm, because it brought a lot of new things to the scene that wouldn't have been there had it not been for Bruce. Did you ever talk to your mom about how things are with Tommy? I don't tell her things, because she doesn't look at me like everybody else, and I don't want her to. I don't want her to know. You know what? That I'm a freak. He doesn't want to be isolated any more than he already is. He doesn't want people to think he's weirder than they already think he is. And so the, so the first time he trusts that doctor, it's a very hard scene for him. It's, it's hard for him to, to to tell somebody the thing, the things that he's he's been holding back so long. I see dead people. How often do you see them? All the time. Because he's got a huge heart, but he has to see all these things, so he always has to feel the, the incredible pain of the people that he sees. The one that probably brought the most challenge for me was the scene when uh, Bruce tells me that he's not going to be my doctor anymore. I'm going to transfer you. I know two psychologists. Don't fail me. Don't give up. You're the only one who can help me. I know it. I can't help you. Cole's emotions sort of reach the highest point, you know, where he gets the most scared because this doctor's coming to his life and he's giving him the first glimpse that maybe there's a way out of being scared all the time and then, and then it's going away and that type of fear, you know, a fear even uh, amazingly beyond what he's been experiencing all his life, that was, uh, it was challenging. I spent a lot of time in rehearsal, you know, the night before with my dad and we studying and going all the scenes that had preceded it and that were coming after it to see what kind of uh, tones had to be there in the scene, you know, what sort of special things that would affect things that would come after it and what I had to bring in to the scene from things that happened before it. The first time I did it, I, I knew it wasn't there, you know, the first take I wasn't happy with and I really had to, to pound it out, you know, I guess I'd gone to the, to really the highest point I'd ever gone with really emotionally pumping myself up for the scene. And it turned out to be, uh, I guess, one of the scenes of, you know, greatest heartbreak because that's where the light at the end of the tunnel is sort of being closed off for him. And that was uh, immensely hard to do. It was a really emotional day. Some of the crew was crying, which is fun, you know, to, to get all worked up like that. And, but it wasn't right for the scene. So we, we kept going to the point where I wasn't crying at all. We did a couple takes like that. I wanted Knight to have as many options as he could in the editing room. I'm not that big a fan of what I call wet scenes, you know, where everybody's just crying all over the joint. Those scenes do exist of me just bawling my eyes out, telling them I, I can't be a therapist anymore, but thank God they're not in the movie. So I think it would have just, it just wasn't right for the character. Bruce goes back to the old session tapes of Vincent, and what seems to be just the most logical place to fast forward past, suddenly he hears my character alone and he hears him start to sort of tremble and be afraid. And then he hears a voice of a man. And what the man is saying is, I don't want to die. A dead person came just like Haley told him they do. He heard the proof. He heard a voice on the tape of, a, of an old man who had, had obviously died and didn't want to. And that's when the light went on in Bruce's character's head. A lot of them had extensive makeup, and sometimes they weren't there at all. <laughs> but uh, the uh, the girl with the videotape, I think she was always there. We usually were both on camera, and she didn't have as much makeup as some of the people with, like, missing limbs or something had to have. His whole life, he'd been running away from these guys. So what happens one time when you, you think they're coming after you to hurt you, so he, you know, he runs and hides behind the sofa, and you think about it, and they're still they're not coming at you anymore. They're not coming. What did she want? Maybe she was trying to tell you something, which is the lesson that Malcolm was trying to pass on. And uh, so he takes one risk and goes back and pulls the sheet off her. It was kind of cool to kind of have the moment, the ghost that he talks to under a sheet. That was kind of our thing, you know. I mean, and Haley understood that. I said, you know, you're basically taking the myth away from this by taking the sheet off of this girl, that, you know, that ghost that so we always picture ghosts, the sheets, woo. And then he pulls the sheet off the girl and basically takes the myth away and it's just a little girl who's hurt and she wants to tell you something. Cut, and we're on our way to her house. That scene in that car, when I read the script, was the clencher for me. That, that really made me want to do it. Let's reset, let's reset. Everything else was great. That was great. Knight was always very adamant about saying they're partners. It's not like a mother and son, you know, you don't talk down to him and he doesn't look up to you. You've got each other and that's it. I'll tell you my secrets. 
I think it's strengthened from that scene in the car Amazing. where he actually speaks honestly for the first time with her and lets her into his world. Oh, you're scaring me. They scare me too sometimes. It was a very important scene to me. I mean, it may be that, you know, that scene that takes you into another level of, you know, wherever you're, you're going, you know, this journey that I'm going on as a storyteller and writing that scene might have been the one that, that, that took me into a deeper place, you know, a culmination of all these things that I had laid in about her dad, about being a mom and all these things and the bumblebee pendant from the grandmother and all comes together. Grandma says. I remember thinking, you know, you could score this and then I was like, but why, you know, but why, it's, it's there. And so that was a, a big step as a filmmaker as well. She said, you came to the place where they buried her. All the way through his takes, it was just this unstoppable flow of something that I had to let go of. Um, I almost didn't have control over it. And when we came to do my stuff, um, which was hours into the working day, um, I think we did a take and then attempted to go in closer, and um, it was already done. Knight and I kind of decided that once you get it, you can't get it again. Uh, so we, that was it. In the structure of The Sixth Sense, to make it work perfectly, you have to have a resolution so complete and, and so fulfilling that you think the movie is over, and that is the car scene of The Sixth Sense. And you know, for almost any movie that is the end of the movie and is and is sure a great unbelievable ending to a movie where the child finally tells his secret to his mom and it had to work I mean I had to think of that as the end of the movie to really make that you know carry the strength and the weight of everything so that the next part was feeling like a coda you know like oh by the way there he's gonna tell his wife he loves him and that's it and that's that's why I was so shocked people starting to pack up their purses wiping their eyes and then they're they go, what? what's going on here? I see people. They don't know they're dead. I believe most people are surprised by their own death. Not, I mean, obviously some people know when, know they're going to die and can't even tell you when, but I, I, would, I would think most people are very surprised they're about to die. That's one of the great conceits of, you know, 21st century man, that we think we're going to live forever. We expect dying in our old age is our, our inheritance somehow, and that's not always the case. <laughs> Normally, films that have surprise endings uh, are... Uh, somebody always gives it away. Whether it's a film critic or, you know, your friend says, oh, this is what happens in this film, we'll go see it anyway. It, no one, no one gave it away, which is a kind of phenomenon in itself. We showed it to a thousand people before they knew, before Sixth Sense was, you know, known or anything. And it was a thousand people that came back with, had no idea, blown away, the collective gasp of a thousand people. That's, that was the perfect scenario because they just, they had no idea there was a twist ending. They had no idea to look for it, nothing. The place was stunned at the end. I think the studio might have thought they had a bomb because it was absolute silence. No clapping, no nothing. Credits started rolling and there was just, you know, this feeling of over, overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed by what they just saw. And, um, and I was like, yeah. And the studio was like, oh no. <laughs> it was fun, it was a fun time. Can you tell me what's exciting about tonight? Oh, well, you know, bringing, bringing my job and my home together is a really great thing, and bringing Bruce here was a cool thing. You know, we're both East Coast boys, so it's fun. The success happened to me when I was 27, and now I'm 30, and um, I now know what it's like to make something that became more than a movie. And so now hit movies don't mean anything to me. You know, I need to make another th experience that is more than a movie, and that's all I set out to do every time now. If I make 10 hit movies in a row, it doesn't matter. That's all because of Sixth Sense. Most people say you can't ever, you can't consciously go make an experience like that, that it just happens, you know? And um, hopefully it, it happened because I was, I, I was seeing something, smelling something, you know? And, um, and hopefully it'll happen again.